On the show today, we will be discussing Christianity Today's latest installment of their Big Tent Conversations, Beyond Gender Roles. Then we will look at a couple news stories regarding the difficult subject of suicide. Um, And then we'll end with a look at an odd but creepy item we ran across a few weeks ago. So we got a good show, so stick with us till the end. All right, let's get to it. Welcome in. This is Religionless Christianity, and we're so grateful that you're joining us. I'm your host, Spencer, and this is my beautiful wife, Nikki. Hello. And if you're new here, we just want to warn you up front, uh, we are not religionless. This show is not religionless. Uh, It's much more the world, and especially this nation that we're in, that is becoming increasingly secular, increasingly religionless, and that, in part, is where the name comes from. So... Uh, On today's show, we're going to do what we always try to do on Saturdays, and that's look at the news of the week, uh, the world around us, and try to make sense of it all from a Christian uh, worldview, biblical worldview. And I think we have some good stories to discuss today. Uh, The bulk of the show is going to be focused on this gender roles debate uh, that Nikki mentioned. We got a lot of clips to play from it, a lot of discussion. This is probably going to be a pretty long episode, but we do hope you stick with us. Uh, Because even the news stories at the end, I think, are pretty good um, discussion topics and just interesting things um, for Christians to think about. So before we get to all of the uh, discussion today, is there anything you'd like to say? Prayer requests, praise reports, anything of that sort? Um, Just pray that my... um, I have an appointment with the gastro clinic. It keeps getting pushed back. Um, It hasn't this time. I got a few more weeks, and hopefully it doesn't get canceled and pushed back again. I was originally supposed to be seen in May. That was canceled, pushed back to July, canceled, pushed back to mid-September now. So pray it doesn't happen a third time and I actually get to be seen. Um, I mean, like, Gut issues are so diverse of what they could be. You can have like one symptom and it could mean 50 different things, but they're all kind of related and will be called the same thing under like the same umbrella, but then it divides up into more specific issues. Um, I mean, I have changed my diet. Your carnivore diet has helped me tremendously, but that doesn't mean whatever the issue is, is actually resolved. It's just, you're just... I just, I don't know if it actually is a healing diet, as a lot of people say. Um, So I still want to be seen. It has to be a healing diet. It's what our Paleolithic ancestors ate, apparently. So I think a lot of people think that they're healed from whatever their issue is because they stick to the diet. But once you go off of it, those um, symptoms will come right back. Maybe not for everybody. Maybe some people are healed, but... For me, I don't think that is the case, and I don't know what I am supposedly healed of if I was healed. So I just want to know. And then from there, I can treat it a natural way. I really don't want to be on um, pharmaceutical pills with all their other side effects. So yeah, just please pray I get seen and um, I get that they figure out. I don't know. I don't know how you pin it down. Like, Like I said, it's so diverse. But anyway... Yeah, just pray about that. Appreciate it. <laughs> They're the experts. They'll figure yeah. it out, no doubt. Oh, um, yeah. Our last uh, article today will make you change your mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for my prayer, praise report, and shame on Nikki for not even mentioning this, the greatest praise report oh. we've had to date. Uh, today is our 18th <laughs> wedding anniversary. So we've been married as of today for 18 years. We are a full adult human in our marriage life at this point, 18 years. So um, (laughs) what is your greatest memory from our past 18 years together? I'm putting you on the spot Mm -hmm. and uh, give you time to think about it. I wouldn't say it's a one thing. It's just been the progress, seeing your sanctification, seeing you really grow in love for the Lord. Um, And that's not like a one-time event, although we have those good moments, but that is the first thing that came to me. That's the thing I'm most proud of, to 
boast about in you is your love for the Lord. So, yeah, that's kind of what I thought of. Wasn't one specific incident or incident, one specific uh, event, but it was just more the longevity. You know, we live in a, you know, fast food society, instant gratification. As soon as something gets boring, you move on to something new and mm-hmm. We see that in relationships a lot. I mean, we're in a Tinder age where you just swipe right if you, you know, whatever <laughs> happens to be. So to actually spend a lifetime with somebody and through all the different changes, you know, even, you know, we met each other when we were 13 in school and to see all of that transformation to now we're almost 40, mm-hmm. I think is really cool. And um, it's a blessing. It's what God designed us to do is to grow old, spend a lifetime together, raise children, you know, build families create legacies, all those sorts of things is what we're designed to do. And um, the marriage relationship is the greatest human relationship we'll ever have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a blessing. It's, you know, if you marry the right person, growing old isn't something you fear. It's more exciting to grow older and see, you know, Mm -hmm. how life is going to play out, the kids and all that sort of stuff is, um, I've always been maybe a bit odd that way. I've always looked forward to getting older. Even as I get older, I'm still excited to get older. Uh, I remember Rush Limbaugh mentioning that years ago, like even he, as he was getting 60, he's like, I can't wait to be 70 and see <laughs> what 70 is like and all this sort of stuff. And I think when your faith is secure and you know, yeah. eternity awaits you, uh, you don't really fear sort of this life ending and the next one beginning. So mm-hmm. yeah, I you just, don't. Yeah. I was just going to say, you don't feel like you're missing out on something worldly. No. So yeah, that's my big praise report. Um, And just pray for us if you guys are listening and watching. And we have another good 18 years. um, So that would be great. (laughs) Now, let's get our plugs out of the way here and we get rolling on this show. So you guys uh, know that we are proud members of the Christian podcast community. Happy to be there. It's a great place to go and find 50 to 60 good indie Christian podcasts all in one feed. So you can find us pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, uh, wherever it happens to be. A lot of these shows are even on YouTube. So um, go check that link out in the show notes, and I think you'll be blessed by it. And we also love Cardinal Contingency Solutions. And one of the things we like to mention about Cardinal pretty regularly is their travel risk management. You know, if you're going overseas to a location you're unfamiliar with, or maybe even is a little less um, first world-ish, maybe a little uh, more third world-ish, definitely reach out to Cardinal and they can help make sure you're prepared um, for whatever exists in that region. And also, you know, what sort of uh, assets and things you can take advantage of if you find yourself in a tough spot, because um, people find themselves in tough spots pretty regularly. So reach out to Cardinal. If you're traveling, if you got missionaries you're sending overseas, they're a great place to go and get the resources you need to make sure that your team or your, you know, you are prepared for whatever might arise while you're overseas or whatever you happen to be doing. Um, And then lastly, the shameless plug here. If you want to help the show out, the easiest way to do that is to just drop a like, subscribe um, if you're on the podcast, follow whatever your platform offers you. And uh, maybe leave a comment, leave a review if that is a a possibility for you. Those things would all help us out immensely. And if you want to help out uh, monetarily, we have affiliate links in the show notes. Um, We have a buy me a coffee, I think, down there. And then I just, because I'd had a couple people ask me about supporting the show, but I guess buy me a coffee is not super easy I don't know if you can set up recurring Hmm. support through buy me a coffee. So I just started up a Patreon for the show just because people have asked me. So we'll have links to the Patreon down uh, in the show notes. I will mention um, you're not really getting anything exclusive by being in the Patreon. That's just an opportunity if you want to support the show Hmm. and we would be blessed by it. There's different tiers in there. They're all the same. It's just how much you would desire to support the show and how much you would desire to bless us with. The only thing that we're offering really in there is sort of a, we wanted to get kind of a community prayer list going. That's something we've always wanted to do with the show. We tried it early on with Discord. That was kind of difficult and clunky. Um, And like weird people would just pop into Discord and 
just try to cause confusion or whatever. So we have a community prayer list on um, Patreon now that we just sort of started. And uh, if you are a Patreon, you'll have access to that. And we'll just ask you to join with us in prayer. We'll join with you in prayer and we'll all just be a community lifting each other's needs before God. Uh, now, I will make this clear that this is not in any way this, you know, 90s television prophet, you know, that for a certain amount of money, you know, we'll oh, gosh. <laughs> bless whatever and God will answer. It's none of that stuff. It's just simply you're supporting the show and you're joining with us in prayer. That's all it is. So just want to make that uh, clear up front. Did somebody ask that before? <laughs> no, but, you know, anytime a Christian asks for support or money or anytime a pastor preaches about tithing or whatever, it's automatic that, ah, oh, this guy's just, you know, trying to take your money. He's a grifter. He's yeah. a con man. And they say and things like, if you give, God will do this. It's like, just give because you want to give, not because you think you're going to be blessed. Yeah. You need I mean, to add that to it. We have obviously no specific blessing that we're going <laughs> to put on your prayer request. Uh, God will bless as God deems um, the need to bless or the desire to bless. And we will just lift your prayer request to him. And pray for you individually if you decide to support the show there, because that would be a blessing to us. So, all right, um, on to the discussion now. So we're definitely, we're going to play the horror music twice now, because we're talking about a Christianity Today discussion. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that is horror music, uh, doubly uh, worthy there. So, um, as Nikki mentioned, this is a part of Christianity Today's what they call sort of their big tent, I think conversations or something to that effect. Um, and this is, I think, the third installment or at least the third time that we've discussed it. Mm -hmm. And this one, as you can see here, if you're watching the video, it's called Beyond the Gender Roles Debate. It was not a debate. No, and it, wa it wasn't a debate at all. It was a conversation and it was, it was interesting in the way that they did it. It was a conversation really hosted by one woman, um, but it was kind of in three uh, different conversations with two women per conversation. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of two women discussing this uh, gender roles topic. And there were more two women paired together who had agreement, so it wouldn't be argument. Right. And there was no argument. You know, there was no rebuttals to what people said. It was right. just simply ask a question. They offered up an answer. Next question. And so there was no debating at all. It was a conversation. I was just kind of thinking, well, I wish the Republican presidential debate would have gone this uh, smoothly, I guess. Clear. Right. And this is a far better environment, <laughs> really, to understand where these women specifically are coming from much better, even as we talked about with the Republican um, debate. The earlier, yeah. you know, family leadership council thing that they had where, they're, you know, Tucker Carlson was interviewing them. That was a far more enlightening mm -hmm. environment for the candidates yeah. than the, the debates. Right. So it was good that this wasn't a debate, just a conversation. But uh, we'll take a look first as we go through this, um, who these women are that are going to be um, in this debate. And then we'll just kind of go through. Like I said, I, we got a lot of clips to play from this. But even before... We get to the clips and all that and looking at the women. I just want to, because Christianity Today wrote, you know, a little couple paragraphs about what this debate was. And I think those are instructive as we uh, get ready to dive into this. So right from the very first sentence of this, you can kind of, you know, get a sense of what they're talking about here. It says, it it's no secret that evangelicals are deeply divided in their view of women's roles in society. And I think this is deceptive. Mm -hmm. I think it's dishonest. Yes, it is. Because there is no real divide amongst evangelicals on women's roles in society. Um, there's yeah. not some large contingent of evangelicals that just, you know, want women in the kitchen only with their shoes off, popping out babies. Like that's kind of a trope that gets lobbed yeah. on people that isn't real. There may be a few, right? A handful of people that believe that. But by and large, there's no big divide amongst evangelicals. No. And then that. society is such a broad word 
that could mean in the work area as well. And that isn't what this is about. This is complementarianism versus egalitarian. And that doesn't apply in the work area. No, and that's the thing. The divide is on largely women in pastoral roles. That's what it should have been focused on, but they didn't stick to that. Well, and they tried to, for the most part, uh, I think a lot of the women did. Some of them were quite off the rails. I think a couple of them didn't really understand. (laughs) Yeah, the divide amongst evangelicals as far as complementarian and egalitarianism is just women's roles in the church, and more specifically, largely in regards to the pastor-elder position. Mm -hmm. That's the divide. Yeah. Uh, So right from the very first sentence of this uh, article, you know, I can say it's starting off pretty poorly, but again, what would you expect from today's Christianity.com? And uh, there was one other set, I think it was the very next sentence in this. um, I want to get to the... uh, the discussion and the women, but this is important. The very next sentence, so we just read the first sentence. The very next sentence says, differing interpretations of the Bible's teaching on women's status, especially as it relates to marriage and ministry, has sparked sharp disagreements among Christians who want to be faithful to the biblical doctrine and denominational tenets while navigating modern expectations. Um, Mm -mm. So basically... (laughs) What Christianity today is saying is the divide in evangelical uh, evangelicalism is those that want to do what the Bible teaches and those that want secular society to dictate their faith, essentially. Yeah. Right? There's a disagreement amongst those who want to adhere to biblical doctrine and those that are, you know, want to bring the Bible up to date with modern society. So yeah. that's not great. Yep. Um. And then one more sentence that I had here that I think sums up this debate, you know, um, especially in regards to like feminism. Um, So let's read this last sentence here. It says, however, complementarians believe the Bible sets clear limits on women's leadership roles, while egalitarians advocate for women's full equality in the church. So you can see their bias right there. Yeah. um, And, you know, I think largely my thoughts, my opinions are this egalitarian debate and um, push for egalitarianism is it's feminism. It's wrapped up in feminism and feminism. It's a quality thing. Yeah. It's a hard banshee to kill. So, um, yeah, I think uh, (laughs) that kind of sets the stage and kind of frames the discussion here. You can tell Christianity Today's view. By the way they... Right. And most people know what Christianity Today's view is going to be. Uh, yeah. They're probably not going to be surprised by the stances from most of these women. But let's look at the women really quickly. So the first one here is Trina Jenkins. And we'll have clips from all of these women. But it says Trina Jenkins is the chief ministry officer and devoted senior pastor's wife at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden in Maryland. And she preaches and teaches uh, throughout the U.S. and Africa, training people to reach their full spiritual potential. Oh, training women. Training women to reach their full spiritual potential. What does that mean? (laughs) Good question. She doesn't really elaborate on it, I don't think, in this discussion. But um, you guys can go ahead and give it a listen and find out for yourself. Uh, the next one up here was Lauren McAfee, mm-hmm. and she is the founder and visionary of Stand for Life. She's also director for ministry. Um, uh, she's a director for ministry investment at Hobby Lobby, and she previously worked for the Museum of the Bible, and she's currently pursuing a PhD and uh, in ethics and public policy and Russell Moore is her supervisor. So that's great. Uh, Next one up here is Susie C. Owens. She is an evangelist, author, radio host, and co-pastor of Greater Mount Calvary Holy Church in Washington, D.C. And she is receiving her doctorate in ministry in African-American leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary. So that's great. (laughs) Uh, Next one up here was Lily Park. 
She serves as an associate professor of biblical counseling at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and she is the author of numerous articles and essays. And then we have Kara Bettis Carvalho. She is an award-winning journalist and associate uh, features editor at Christianity Today. And uh, among the many stories that she has written, she last year wrote about Scot Scottish complementarians who teach women to preach. And then the last one here who was kind of the host of the overall event was Nicole Massey Martin, who we have seen in previous Big Tent conversations. And she is the Chief Impact Officer for Christianity Today, which is apparently a job title. And um, she's also the author of two books, Made to Lead, Empowering Women for Ministry, and Leaning In, Letting Go, a Lenten Devotional. All right. So uh, getting all that out of the way, that's who they are. We'll hear a little bit from each of them, I believe. Yeah, I think we hear from Nicole Martin. That might be mm -hmm. the, the one we hear from the least. So. Yeah, she's, yeah. Yeah, so we'll just kind of get into this and start hearing what these women specifically have to say. All right, Lauren, let's dig right in because time is flying already, and I know everybody is eager to dive into the conversation. What is a complementarian? <laughs> yeah, so good. No, I just want to say thank you so much, Nicole, for hosting this conversation, and you were one of the people that I called whenever lots of conversations were stirring around this because I, I knew you were my friend that I could have an honest conversation with that you're so gracious in, in conversations. And so I'm just grateful for your heart and your ministry. So thank you for hosting all of us here today for this important conversation. So um, this is Lauren McAfee. She's sort of the bulwark of this discussion in the complementarian camp. But uh the first thing that I wanted to mention, because it stands out to me, has nothing really to do with complementarianism and egalitarianism, but it also has everything to do with complementarianism and egalitarianism. Because I think right from the jump, and this happens throughout this entire conversation, like almost every single time a woman starts talking to another or responding, whatever happens to be, uh, the girls are almost falling all over themselves to like acknowledge and thank and praise and point out all the, you know, great and, you know, beneficial things. And you're so inspirational, all this sort of stuff to, throughout the entire conversation. Um, and it just made me think that like, not trying to offend anyone, but women to a large degree, I don't think are built for debate and confrontation. And I would say that that's by design. That's part of their nature. I think women are sweet. They're nice. They're kind. They don't want to hurt feelings or upset people. Yeah. You know, so even in a setting like this, you know, a discussion on your specific beliefs and stuff like that about a given topic, it's like the women are bending over backwards to make yeah. sure the other hosts, the other um, participants, they know that they love them, they respect them, all this sort of stuff. And to me, it highlights exactly why men are created to be leaders and they're more they fit more naturally into those molds i think it's a small thing but it definitely stood out to me because it's not uncommon to hear someone say hey thank you very much i appreciate it but the excessive levels that they went to it just it stood out to me and i was like yep that makes sense i think it's because women are more easily hurt and offended and you just see that among like little kids like little girls are always the ones to get into their stupid little arguments and yeah. hurt each other's feelings little boys play and they're not like that i think no. it is it's that difference in male and female the way we are emotionally um so because women are more um just easily hurt we know that about ourselves and about each other so we compliment more we show we speak appreciation more it's just the way it is yeah i can see that i don't know i i still think that they planned it for this though because it is overboard yeah i'm sure you know and i think they were really trying to not make this a tense environment mm -hmm. you know but again as we'll play throughout this i think there are certainly clips and things said on here where there should have been pushback like severe pushback but again, that wasn't the environment. And again, I just don't know that women 
certainly there are women that have that ability. I'm not saying that this is a blanket over all women, but I right. think by and large, you can see the tendency here. So I think it's a uh, a good highlight between uh, male and female leadership. At least it was to me. So mm-hmm. let's get into the real first clip, Lauren's sort of answer on what complementarianism is. Complementarian theology and what we mean by that At the high level, I would say to be complementarian means, and some of these will agree on, that God created male and female, right? We can agree on that. Mm -hmm. Um, They're two different genders, each made in the image of God and having equal value. And where we might start to differ now is that in the genders, there are distinct roles, that each gender, while having equal dignity and value Mm -hmm. as image bearers of God, have unique and distinct ways of reflecting God's glory. And more specifically, that is applied to how men and women are serving in church roles, church leadership roles, and in marriage. So whenever complementarian uh, positions are talking, they're, they're typically applying this understanding that there are different, in, in the two genders that God created, there are differences in the roles for men and women. And that's not to say we fit into stereotypes Mm -hmm. as it is to say that we have unique and distinct ways that we get to represent God Mm -hmm. in our world in how we relate to one another and serve one another in the context of church ministry and leadership, Mm -hmm. as well as in our marriages. Mm -hmm. And I. So a bit of a lengthy uh, definition there from Lauren on what complementarianism is, but I think it's a fine definition. You know, I don't think I'd push Mm -hmm. back too much on it. You know, I think, like we mentioned earlier, the argument is about roles in the church and the family home. Mm-hmm. You know, some people, and again, you know, they try to undermine the conversation or the discussion by extending it beyond that, mm-hmm. you know, saying that somehow, well, that means women must be sub- subservient or they, they have to submit to all men, all these sorts of things. Um, but that's not the argument as far as we're concerned. It's church and the family home, the mm-hmm. marriage relationship. So um, Lauren goes on there, or she goes on to highlight um, what complementarianism is not, and I think that's worth listening to as well. Complementarian is not a hierarchical view of people, meaning that, mm. that certain genders rank more hierarchically above others. Equal value, equal dignity, there's no hierarchy here in terms of value, yeah. It is just that there is different levels of authority and stewardship of authority for for some gen for men in mm-hmm. church and um, marriage and and to recognize that authority is not the right to rule but it is the responsibility to serve and so mm-hmm. there's a distinction not hierarchy not hierarchical mm-hmm. not either traditionalism meaning that uh, complementarian means you just want things to look back like they did in the 1950s and whatever gender stereotypes were in that sense. So complementarian doesn't mean we care about tradition. It means we care about what the Bible says and trying to apply that into our church and marriages. Mm -hmm. And it's also complementarianism is not patriarchy. So patriarchy kind of being this understanding of uh, misogyny, Mm -hmm. uh, men trying to suppress or squelch women and their ability to use their gifts. We reject that. I reject Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, complementarian, we reject patriarchy and recognize that in each of our differing roles, there is beauty in how we work together and Mm -hmm. both have the opportunity to serve the kingdom of God in our roles, in our churches and in our marriages. So So that's her understanding of what complementarianism is not. And the only area of pushback that I would have here is I think her thoughts on patriarchy. You know, she kind of says that complementarianism is not patriarchy because patriarchy is kind of trying to, you know, I don't know what word she used there, but kind of crush and hold down women and these sorts of things. And I don't see that as being patriarchy. I think patriarchy is quite simply just male leadership. You know, it's male leadership. And I think um, that any family or any even nation, whatever you want to call it, that is going to be God fearing, those cultures are going to be God fearing. Um, I think it's going to be fashioned after patriarchy because that's a biblical understanding of headship. So I don't, you know, again, there's perversions of everything and there's male leadership that does seek to squash women and, you know, uh, exercise Mm -hmm. authority 
undue authority over them and all these sorts of things. But I don't think that that's um, a proper understanding of patriarchy. I think a simple understanding is the best one, and that's just male leadership. So complementarianism, in a sense, does advocate for patriarchy because we would believe in patriarchy as being a far more um, God-ordained type of leadership structure. Mm -hmm. And then just with the scripture in mind that, you know, wives submit to husbands, but husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. And, you know, women was created, you know, the helper, but man is also the protector. Like men and women do have their roles in their... Um, their gifts, but it's to the betterment of one another because there's no other way around it. Like men are protectors and they're leaders that goes together, those two qualities. No, I think our country in 2023 is a perfect example of what happens when you lose that patriarchal structure mm -hmm. and the roles begin to be switched and feminism takes root. And we see the chaos that it's causing and the weakness that it's um, just ravaging this entire country with from basically everybody on a global stage. I mean, everything. Um, weakness is abounding, it seems, as we've sort of mm -hmm. lost our more, I guess, God-ordained, um, God-designed structure of leadership, of headship. So at least that's the way I yeah, see Yeah, just it. reflect on your own life. I mean, I just know for me, like, I can see it with me and Spencer. Like he's, you know, the the steady person, the clear thinking, like he has a leader mindset. And in me, like I'm the one who keeps peace in the home. I keep it organized. It's just, it's this perfect balance. Like I help you, but you help me lead as I'm helping you. And it's for the betterment of our children, for a peaceful home. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I definitely, you know, agree with a lot of what she says there. I just would push back slightly on the patriarchy piece, uh, unless her mm. idea is a perversion of patriarchy, then she's probably right. But otherwise, just a simple, straightforward understanding, mm. I would push back a little bit. So she seems like she would, she doesn't seem like the kind of person who would argue if somebody corrected her on that definition. No, she seemed, of all the women on this discussion, uh, she stood out to me as, um, I, the best is a bad word, but uh, she the most, trusts in scripture the most, the most sensible, yeah. I guess, yeah. um, or grounded, yeah, I guess is the one word I would use there. So, mm -hmm. but they go on to give their definition here of what egalitarianism is in this conversation. So let's hear what Nicole Martin has to say about egalitarianism. So for egalitarians, um, the core understanding is that God created us with gifts for the upbuilding of the church and that those with gifts for leadership were given the ability to lead in the church in any capacity, men serving in leadership over women, women serving in leadership over men. And I would also say, I think the traditional egalitarian statement is that that same parity, that same equal access because of gifting in the church would apply in the home, that the traditional egalitarian would say, there is no head of household. We are together leading our household with our gifts. So that, again, is the understanding of what egalitarianism is going forward for this conversation. And I think it's a definition I would be fine with for egalitarianism. And what's interesting is just before that clip, um, right before the one that we played, Nicole Martin said that she grew up in a church understanding that the Genesis context of male and female being made in God's image meant that they were both to be used um, to build up God's church. And again, that pushed her into egalitarianism. But we would agree with that, that men and women are both to be used to build up the church. Yeah. Yeah just in their proper functions. Mm -hmm. And I would say that for the way that I would view it, she's not seeing that proper function um, the same way we would see it. And it is interesting to even go to the extent that like there is no headship in the home. Mm -hmm. It's total equality in the home. And again, it's a bit of a play on words because like Nikki said, they do work together, you know, the wife submits to the husband, the husband loves the wife, you know, they work together. 
Um, but to just to be like, nah, it's all equal across across the board seems bizarre to me. When there's no leadership and everybody is just like a team, but when there's a disagreement, there's no submission to anybody. And I was just thinking, I just saw an ad for, I think it was like air conditioning and cooling or something. I don't know if you noticed it, mm -hmm. um, how they were saying on there, you know, like join our team, whatever. But they even said like, we don't have like a boss. We're all a team. And I'm thinking like, I don't know how that's going to work. Like you need leadership in anything for it to function properly. Yeah. Sometimes people just try to outthink the room. I know every business since the dawn of time has had bosses and supervisors, not us. You're going to get the just... wrong employees advertising that way, trying to hire people. You're going to get a bunch of people who don't want to submit to leadership, who don't want to follow the format, the way that things work best. Because you'd be like, no, this is my idea. We're a team. We well, got to... Every ship needs a captain. Yes. That is uh, just the way <laughs> things work. So I'm sure that business will not be a business very long then it's under like that two, structure. It's two kingdoms divided against itself when you see yourselves as both equal authority. Yeah. So I guess that's, you know, their egalitarian view is 100% everything's equal across the board. There is no uh, headship. They're both just submitting to each other. So. And if it works, yeah, that's like a rare thing. It can work. It's not that it can't, but that isn't going to work for the majority of marriages or for any anything. Well, that's why a lot of marriages struggle and Half of them fail. But I was hoping that in this debate, and they didn't really, but that the egalitarian, I was hoping that they would bring up um, what they believe, you know, the differences were for men and women, like the different functions and the different purposes that they were created for. Or is yeah. it just all crossover, 100% crossover? You know, because when you think about it, like, you know, God gave women the blessing of child rearing. They gave God gave uh, women the blessing of bringing life into this world. That's a very unique mm -hmm. function and purpose for women. Um, kind of being the primary, you know, tutor and teacher in the home that women are as they're rearing these children. Mm -hmm. So, like, what did He give men specifically then? If everything's yeah. equal, one hundred percent crossover, but women have their own unique rightness yes, from God. What do men have? What do men have? I know. I think. That's a really good point to bring up because those roles for women are like obvious ones, especially like the nurturing of the child and like being, you know, being the sole person the child needs from birth. Like that's definitely not a man's role. Like you can't say it's equal. The man can't take the child and be like, no, I'm going to do that. Like that's impossible. So, so I well, nurse the children. I mean, there's men who did. I know they, they yeah. got those weird things you can connect that has the milk. I don't know. They got I don't know. wacky things, but. Is that egalitarianism? It probably is. So there's just those obvious roles that pertain just to women. But what about men? What are are there any obvious roles that we can say, yeah, a woman definitely can't can't do that. So where's the equality for men then, since they can't perform some of these things only women can? So is it just women who do it all, and we can boast that we don't need men because we can grow life and. And we could sustain that life. Well, that's after. why, you know, I would love to actually hear a discussion because throughout this conversation, a couple of women mention, you know, the equality before God that men and women have, even though they have different functions and things like that, but they never really explain what they think those functions are. Yeah, they didn't. And I would like to hear, you know, what do they actually see as the differing roles and purposes for male and female, or do women stand alone as having unique function and purpose for God and... Men are just there to support it. I don't know. Um, be interesting discussion there. But yeah. she does, I think, in there say that egalitarianism isn't feminism. I think that was one of the things Nicole Martin said. And I, again, would push back here. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And I think you can see that and you can hear that in these arguments. Even going back and reading those first couple sentences in the article that we read mm -hmm. you, you know, that this idea is based on modern society. You know, so... The egalitarian, the Christian may not see it as feminism, but it is feminism because feminism has infected our culture in almost every aspect of our culture. So just claiming that, well, it's a part of modern culture, not feminism, well, no, then it is part of feminism because feminism has, uh, feminism has infected our modern yeah. culture. So you can't avoid that. You know, and again, especially when you're making the argument that 
well, there's a big divide here. One wants to adhere to biblical doctrine. One wants to bring it up to speed with modern society. Well, then that's feminism. I mean, you, there's no way of getting around that. Yeah. So, and one thing that stood out to me during the Nicole and Lauren discussion um, was Nicole, she recalled, as you guys probably heard, the tradition that she grew up in was kind of influential in her life. But Lauren mentioned her understanding of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be clear that Bible trumps tradition. Mm -hmm. And Lauren is going to go on in this conversation to expound on this and sort of her mm -hmm. closing arguments. Uh, but we have to be, as Christians, people that submit our experiences, our traditions, everything to the Bible. None of that trumps the Word of God. So mm -hmm. we need to be clear when someone's talking about, well, my experience, my tradition, great. Does it line up with the Bible? If not, then toss it out. Yeah, you're looking to yourself and your life as the authority on something that God has already spoken about. He's the authority on it. We don't look to ourselves for the truth. We look to God's word for the truth. And that's what Lauren kept saying in a non-argumentative way. Um, I'm glad she said it, though. But, she, I mean, if you can't debate, at least they gave them time to speak their interpretation of scripture, which hers is with scripture. So you'll notice that. Well, and, you know, even this idea of tra uh, tradition, that's one of the, like, large complaints that we would lob against the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and where yeah. they go wrong in their understanding is that they lift tradition to almost the same level as scripture, um, if not in some cases above scripture. Yeah. And um, I think Judaism does as well. You know, tradition is right on par with scripture. And, you know, so if we're going to lob those accusations against the Catholics or, you know, Jews on that level, that they're wrong in their understanding, you know, that tradition is on the same level, then we have to be um, equal in our, I guess, I, our disagreement with the egalitarian mindset that, well, just because I grew up in church environments where women were leaders and, and all this sort of stuff, so that means it's okay. No, you're putting your tradition above God's word, and if it's wrong for the Catholic, well, it's wrong for you here as well. So just something I think all Christians should try to um, make sense of in their own life. We all have tradition and experiences, but all of that needs to be tested against the Word of God. So the next lady up here in this discussion was Cara Carvalho, and um, let's hear what Cara Carvalho has to say. And so I guess in summary, what I'd say for myself on that is a lot of my conviction, I would say, comes before my experience. Um, for me, it comes out of my study of scripture. Um, specifically, I think Genesis 1 through 3 is very foundational for me, um, just the way God has designed um, equal but distinct genders who he loves equally, um, but are different. There are. So Nikki and I had, I guess, a bit of a disagreement here. I don't know if Kara is a complementarian or an egalitarian. Um, she never, I don't think, clearly defines where she mm -mm. stands. I don't think she does. And I took her as being egalitarian because when she referenced right there, her foundation came from Genesis 1 through 3, where God created men and women perfectly equal. Um, but then she mentions there that there are differences and stuff like that. So again, I would love to know, have her expound on that. Maybe she was meaning like equal in value, like Lauren had said in the beginning. We're equal in value to God, but we are different. That's how I took it when she said that. I thought she was kind of just bouncing off what Laura had said. She might have. Or Lauren, um, what's her name? <laughs> but I just wasn't clear on that. And I thought that she was egalitarian because it seemed like they tried to pair an egalitarian and complementarian together in each pair. So Nicole was the egalitarian with Lauren. Oh, um, okay. Kara, Maybe. I think, is the egalitarian with Lily, who we'll get into um, here in a minute, was the complementarian. And then the Trina is a complementarian, and Susie is egalitarian. So she's a bit confusing here, Kara. She's kind of tough to get a grasp on. But from what I understood, she is leaning into Genesis 1 through 3 as her understanding of why egalitarian theology is the proper understanding. Yeah. I mean, she mentioned she had leadership roles, but not pastoral. 
Yeah, like in the church, you know, different staff positions and stuff like that. And she went to seminary, but not, she made a point to say not to be a pastor. She just wanted to learn for her own understanding of theology. Um, so I just think even based on that, that doesn't mean she's egalitarian. I don't, like, I know we went over that article before, like, women, should they go to seminary? And I didn't personally have an issue with women going to seminary just to to learn, but not to be a pastor. So I didn't. I don't think that means egalitarian, just because she wanted to learn. So, yeah, I, don't know. I just took it as because she talks about growing up in her complementarian tradition, um, but I took her as she sort of broke away into an egalitarian mindset. But again, if you guys give this a listen, let us know what is Kara because <laughs> I don't think I have an idea. And on that, I would say I don't know that I would support women going to seminary, just because. I think the only purpose for seminary is to build pastors. I mean, there's a lot of Christian colleges and stuff that can teach you theology and um, all that sort of stuff. But seminary is a very specific type of education that I think right. should largely be for pastors. Yeah, because I guess uh, if you can get that degree to be a pastor, then that's where it kind of veers off. Yeah, yeah. so just, but yeah, we're not really sure. So uh, that's Kara. But they also go on here and they talk about what churches can do to make sure women are seen and heard. And I'm kind of paraphrasing this a bit, but uh, let me see if I have... I don't know that I played any clips here from Lily, so forgive me for that. I didn't because I thought largely what she said was kind of inconsequential. She kind of talked around a lot of things without any make like making any kind of clear and distinct points. Yeah. It's like she talked a lot, but I really, yeah, I know what you mean. Maybe she's the perfect college professor. Talks and talks, but never really says anything. Maybe she could be a politician. Um, <laughs> but uh, she made mention in there, you know, they kind of talked about what can you do to make sure women are seen and heard. And uh, from a com uh, complementarian perspective was the kind of the way the question was framed. You know, hey, egalitarians are great because they lift women up. Well, what can complementarians do to make sure women are seen and heard? And she mentioned that they had to make sure that the staff members knew they were valuable. Um, I just think that's so silly because even if it's egalitarian setting, you can ask them the same question. It's like, are they not seen and heard because they're complementarian? That doesn't, that's just implying that if you're of that belief that you're the women in your church or in your home are not noticed. Well, and that's kind of the argument that gets lobbed on complementarians is that, you know, they exercise authority over women. They see women as a sort of a lesser creation in God's eyes and these sorts of things. So, well, you need to make sure that you're doing enough to, you know, let these women know that they're seen and heard and valued and all this sort of stuff. And now, of course, everyone likes to be valued in their workplace and stuff, of course. Um, but to me, when I heard this, this sounded like what Vody was warning us about when we talked about his three red flags two or three weeks ago, about churches that are preaching more psychology than scripture, mm -hmm. because a pastor's job or elder's job, which are, is who leads a church, unless you have you know a mega church, then you probably have boards and all different things, but pastors and elders, their job is to train a congregation in righteousness. That's their, their job you know, take care of orphans and widows and this sort of stuff. And how Not many leadership positions are there in a church for a woman to do, or even the men? Because the men are elders, so there's obviously more leadership positions available, but they are positions for the men, pastor and elder. Right, mostly. And now, again, the bigger your church gets, and, you know, obviously you're going to have, right. you know, administrators or secretaries, maybe security, different things like that. But, yeah, um, there's probably not a ton or there shouldn't be, you know, you don't want to be in a church with all of your tithe money going to just play, pay some bloated, you know, employee staff, you know, and now you're not sending money overseas right. or whatever. But um, the job of a pastor elder should be to train you in righteousness, not necessarily to make sure that, you know, everybody's getting employee of the month awards and making sure that they feel, you know, loved and valued and seen and right. heard. Now you should be trying to make sure employees know they're valuable. But again, that should not be your focus and your goal. Um, that should just come naturally because you're a Christian and you care and love for people. 
or you care and love people, but you know, the job of the church is not to make sure every Buddy feel you know gets a pat on the back and they're spreading around awards equally and this all these affirmation sorts of yeah society we're in everything needs everybody needs to feel everybody just wants to be noticed and seen and be unique I think I that just is want to know that it. you see me get out of my face mm-hmm. um, but you know I would say that if you're of an egalitarian mindset though um, I would say. You know, because as we've discussed, I think an egalitarian tends to have a mindset that's based more in modern culture. That's kind of the way that they're seeing things. Mm-hmm. So I think that this sort of psychology, um, this look at psychology being seen and heard in the workforce would also be very important to you as well. You know, like I said, everybody wants to be valued in the workplace, but I think someone who has an egalitarian, modern view of, you know, society and culture in the church. Well, our society is all about being seen and heard and valued and all these different things. So that's probably going to be more important to an egalitarian minded Christian that they, you better, you know, affirm me and let Mm -hmm. me know my value and all these different things. And if you don't feel affirmed, then, you know, something's wrong with them or there's some type of bigot because you don't feel affirmed in the way you want to be. Yeah. And as they'll discuss through this uh, conversation here just go find a different church, just get up and leave. They advocate pretty strongly for that. So let's move on here to Susie Owens. There's always a Susie Owens, isn't there? Goodness gracious. Let's hear what Susie Owens has to say. I think for me, it was the fact that I felt called to preach. I didn't need anybody to tell me I felt called of God to do it. Susie Owens was called of God. And, you know, one of the things that you'll hear, especially if you listen to this conversation, but generally you hear this a lot, a lot, especially from women, more so than from women, at least in my experience, you'll hear a lot about their gifting. You know, how can they exercise their gift and make the most of their gift? And then you hear Susie here, she was called and her calling and this sort of stuff. You hear this a lot, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, you hear it a lot. We've heard it a lot on a lot of the. I mean, they probably say stuff. gifting fifty times in this conversation here. You know, giving women an opportunity to to utilize their gifts and different things like that. I know. I don't like that she is teaching women, especially moms, that they need to figure out their calling, like as if raising kids isn't a calling and worthy of the recognition. Like, that's just her saying she doesn't value that. Like, that is the highest calling to have children and raise them up in God's ways. There's nothing that brings God more glory than giving him more children who love him when you raise them in his ways. What He wants people's hearts. He doesn't want your your articles and your books and your sermons. Well, and, you know, we would com- complain, a, you know, a lot on this show about having two, you know, full-time working parents and how that can hinder your children, right? Because you're essentially um, offloading your parenting duties to someone else. So you can go and chase full-time careers. And that doesn't change just because both of your full-time careers are in the church. You're still both offloading, most likely, your parenting responsibilities in a lot of respects to someone else. So, yeah, we don't think that that's the best environment to be raising children in. Um, The mother should be the primary um, trainer, teacher, tutor, you know, and all these things of the children. And just because you Mm -hmm. say, well, I'm a pastor now, so it's all right that I'm not there to do that. I would disagree. And now we don't know what Susie Owen's life looks like. I'm just, you know, kind of talking from, you know, a broad brush here. But yeah, just saying, well, we both work full time, but it's in the church. So it's better than being, you know, in some corporate environment. I would say no, it's the same thing. Um, I think it's like that women are just with this mindset are just being prideful. Like they want others in the church to they they want to make a name for themselves instead of minding their own business and taking care of their families doing the work that nobody sees except God and the impact it has on your children it's 
you are like sowing those seeds in the dark and the fruit of your labor will show up later. But it's, it is like that instant gratification, that instant, I want to be recognized for my gifts now. Like you don't want to wait for all the, the work you put in with your children and for them to be grown up and be fruitful. You don't want to wait for that. You want to be seen now. So you, you just sacrifice your children really and forfeit that that fruit that you would have seen for the immediate recognition and the the glory you think you're giving to God pursuing other things. Yeah, and I just, you know, I don't think that this is something you hear nearly as frequently from men. That's why it stood out to me. Yeah, you're right. I feel like women are always talking about their giftings and callings. And again, mm -hmm. part of that could be well, you guys haven't let us utilize our gifts for all these centuries, so nobody we have to was explain it. Stopping. But I just think, <laughs> you know, it's just like them trying to, um, I guess, convince you that they should have this position, right? By telling you all their gifting, it just it stood out to me because they say it a lot. So mm -hmm. now, as far as Susie Owens, um, I believe she's a heretic, and we're going to highlight that in, in a. Uh, in a little bit later on in this conversation, but, you know, she says that she felt called to preach, so she didn't need to be told. Um, and I'll just say, again, we mentioned this earlier, but how you feel, what you think and this sort of stuff, or even what you heard, you know, the Lord told me, uh, is irrelevant if it goes against the teaching of scripture. Mm. You know, how you felt makes no difference if the Bible doesn't teach it. Um, or it and then goes what against what the Bible teaches. Yeah, if the if the Lord called her to preach, she wouldn't be preaching verses out of context. She's not gifted in teaching and preaching. Um, it isn't of God. So you can be assured God didn't call her. At least from our uh, short time here with Susie, that's the way we we felt, and that's what we took away from it. And you know, but Scripture trumps your feelings. You know, it trumps your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um. And one of the things that we see more and more in America is this, right? People claiming that their feelings are from God. And, you know, we all know the verse here. I'll throw it up on the screen. We're familiar with it. Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? So we... Deceitful. That's the main thing. Yep. You're it's being deceitful, deceived. Right? Your you heart is deceiving you. can't trust your own feelings. Uh, we must trust God's word, mm -hmm. even if it goes against our own feelings. So the way you feel is not the voice of God. We can't. That is a like pagan or a new age teaching to like follow little inclinations or look for signs. Like I don't know what people mean when they say God called me or the Lord told me. I don't know what they're talking about. How? In a dream, you just had a, an urge, a feeling. Yes, maybe he could tell me as well if you showed me in the Bible where he said it. Otherwise, and again, I think a lot of that is, you know, you can't push back on somebody when they say, well, the Lord told me. Okay, well, then what argument do I have here? Well, I didn't hear it. Well, he told me. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, he told you to go against his own word. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's hear what else Susie Owens has to say. And I think it's up to women for them to discover what it is that they feel God's purpose is for their life and then walk therein. I don't what, what they feel God's purpose is for their life. Yeah. This is dangerous, I <laughs> yeah. would say, um, from Susie. We have a lot nice. of clips from Susie. None of them are good. Um, but, you know, if pride is the chief sin of man, then it's natural that if asked, right, most people are going to believe that they can be leaders and most will seek out opportunities for leadership, right? Very few people, like Nikki would, you know, had said earlier that if asked, right, they would say, I want to sow my seeds in the dark, right? I want to, you know, work quietly for the Lord and uh, I want to be out of the limelight in these sorts of things. That's not man's sinful, prideful heart. So if you just go, I want you to go and discover and see what you're felt called to do. And be like, well, I'm called, everyone's called to be a leader, right? That's why all these people that claim to have some, uh, what is it? The, um, 
like prior life reincarnation, they're always like a prince or a queen of some place. And you're like, nobody was ever a chimney sweep <laughs> in their <laughs> prior life. They're all goddesses and gods, right? Um, because our heart's deceitful and pride, you know, racks all of us. And so, yeah, you tell somebody like, listen, just go see what you feel like you're called to do. Oh, every one of us is called to be a leader. That Shocking. That is the voice of Satan. Get your eyes off the greatest thing you could do and seek other things still in the name of God. That is so deceitful. That is exactly how Satan works. Yeah, it made me think of Stephen, you know, in the book of Acts, right? And, um, you know, it talks about who Stephen is. He was, you know, filled with wisdom. He was doing miracles, um, goes and he basically uh, excoriates the Pharisees that they don't understand the scriptures as well as he does. Great man of God. And what was he called to do? To be a deacon. Go feed the orphans and widows. He, he couldn't have been an apostle. He couldn't have been leading churches. Nope. His calling from God was to go feed the orphans and widows and then die in a horrific fashion. Mm. Who's felt called to do that? <laughs> right now we're all apostles we're all mega church pastors we're all mm. whatever right just follow your heart whatever you're going to be praised by men from so so yeah i'm sure that there are people out there that exist that want to be out of the limelight want to serve quietly for the lord um but you don't see them a lot i don't know very many of those people so don't trust your heart follow god's word but uh susie mentioned here or earlier in this conversation, that her tradition was egalitarian as well. You know, that's what she grew up in. She said she grew up in an environment where women were leaders in the church and the home. And this is just strictly an observation from me, uh, watching this one conversation. But Nicole Martin is a black woman. Susie Owens is a black woman. And Trina Jenkins is a black woman. And they all three said that they looked back on their traditions growing up in an egalitarian environment. Now, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit here, but I want to play Trina basically highlight exactly this point here. So let's hear Trina. This, this slippery slope is in, is in the church. And when you look in our community, um, women have always been in leadership roles Absolutely. in the church. You know what I mean? We have been very instrumental in how... Um, how discipleship was happening and leading how evangelism, how people are coming to Jesus. And we've always been um, right there making it happen in the church and in the community. So now, if you aren't watching this on YouTube, Facebook, or Rumble, um, we are not black, <laughs> Nikki and I. Uh, not sure you can tell that from our the tone of voice here. Uh, we didn't grow up in the black church. But so my question is, um, for any who are out there that know did grow up in the black church or whatever, is this just the most common environment for um, blacks, black Christians in this nation, an egalitarian worldview, egalitarian theology? Um, my thought is that it is, you know, um, a lot of what you see, you know, we've mentioned Jason Whitlock a lot on this podcast. We really enjoy it. You know, I listen to Jason Whitlock a lot, and he talks about the matriarchal, I don't know if that's the word, matriarchal uh, nature of the black community. So it would seem natural that if you grow up in a matriarchy, like a lot of um, black folks are, especially maybe in the last 60, 70 years, whatever happens to be a very matriarchal society that you're going to view every area of your life through the lens of female leadership and female empowerment, even your religion. But that doesn't make it right. And again, that's where, you know, we have to go back to what we said before, that your traditions, your experiences, all these sorts of things have to be um, retested in light of Scripture. You can't look back and go, well, I was raised in a egalitarian world, so that makes it okay, right? Because the same thing you wouldn't say, well, I grew up in a time when slavery was all right, so slavery is good. You'd be like, what does the Bible say? <laughs> Let's look at that, right? Um, you'd test it all. You know, I grew up in a household where we beat women, so I beat my wife, 
well, that's not all right. <laughs> so, doesn't make it all right. Right. Let's yeah. test it against scripture. But I'd just like to hear from you guys. Um, if you are familiar with this culture, um, is this what you would see? And this why you would think, you know, all three of these women hold to an egalitarian worldview because that's the world that they grew up in. Mm-hmm. Um, just thought it was interesting. And um, another point here from Susie, jumping back to what she said, uh, she pointed out, again, that there were, that you can go through scripture, she says, and you can find many divides about the roles. You know, the scripture has many mm-hmm, divides mm-hmm. about the different roles. But she never points out what those divides are. She never highlights any of the scriptures. And again, I would love to hear them expound on that um, because I do believe that there's probably um, good or sound arguments that people would make for egalitarianism. I don't think these women made any. Mm -mm. And if there are all these different scriptures, um, I'd be interested to know what they are so we could look into them ourselves. I think that'd be valuable for all of us. And I know I've done that before. I'm like, where does it say? It says something about, like, I'll know the scripture, but I won't be able to, like, cite it. Um, but it just made me laugh. I was thinking about um, if you guys follow Miss Melissa Doherty, because she kind of jokes about that, like people who say it's in the Bible or something. <laughs> and I know I've done that, too, but it's just funny. She's got, like, a, a coffee mug that says that phrase on there. It's it's in the Bible or something. I think it is. <laughs> right. And, you know, we... We looked at some of the specific verses, you know, when we talked about Rick Warren and his egalitarian beliefs and the verses that he pulled out for it. And it seems like all the verses that I've heard from the egalitarian argument, and, you know, even in here, Kara mentioned Genesis 1 through 3. Um, It's like they always go for sort of the muddled or the, um, you know, kind of like the muddled verses, and they dismiss the clear verses. So they dismiss Mm -hmm. 1 Timothy and mm-hmm. the qualifications for yeah. elder. They just toss that right out. And then they go to, you know, like Rick Warren. Well, the Great Commission. Sure. But what about First Timothy? Ah, that's difficult to understand. You're like, seems pretty clear. Mm-hmm. You know, or well, we go to Genesis. And then you're like, well, what about Genesis where God made man first and set him as the authority over everything? And where it says he gave woman as a helper. I got to tell right? you something. When I'm, I started reading this book um, at the chapel here on base, and it's called Raising Responsive Children, but the first couple chapters are really just about God and creation, and the, it is about the roles, really gender roles. And it points out how Adam was placed in the garden. He was told to take care of the garden, cultivate it. Only he was to name the animals. Um, God first said, I'm going to give you a helper. And then he tells him to name the animals. And God, all, or Adam also named Eve, he said she's woman. He ha- The man has different roles. He didn't make Eve and then say, all right, you guys together name the animals. Like, really pay attention to, I think, because man is to um, be the provider. Adam knew how to cultivate the ground to get food out of it. God had him learn all this hard work. I don't know how long before he made Eve, but Adam was working before Eve was made. Adam had named all the animals that existed before Eve was made. And then Eve comes along. She had no part in that. He was the one to lead her and teach her everything that he had learned and to guide her. That is her. funny. Like, he does all this, tills the whole garden, all the animals, working like a dog. And then she shows up and she's like, so what do we got to do? And he's like, I've done everything. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm going to go bathe in the river. No, he's going like, to be like, you're going to work with me. Awesome. This is, you're no, going to help me. <laughs> right. So they tend to go towards the muddled. Um, for, and not to say that they're muddled, right? The Great Commission is not unclear. You know, God's design in Genesis 1 through 3 is not unclear, but they kind of make it unclear. Whereas the one that is just blatantly obvious, Paul teaching, right? The qualification, they just, they don't even recognize it as an actual, you know, authority or verse. 
And in fact, Susie will touch on in her heretical claim, she dismisses it outright. So um, let's hear, though, what Susie, um, what else she has to say. The hits keep rolling from Susie. But I think especially in this day and time, especially in this day and time, you're going to see women rise in secular worlds and secular positions. And the church does not want to lag behind and those kind of opportunities. Yeah. So. Well, opportunity. What is the church missing out on that it. Right. And this is just like maybe the most glaring example from this conversation that culture drives this egalitarian belief system mm -hmm. and not the word of God. You know, hey, you don't want to fall behind what those corporate offices are doing. They got female executives. So if you want to get good leadership, you better get yourself some female pastors. Like, so it's like the nope. church is learning how to function by looking at the world is what she's saying. That's explicitly what she says here. And, you know, you couple that with the DIE that's running rampant in the country, the pride religion that's gripped this nation, you know, and they'll make sure that your church does not lag behind here, right? Yeah, that goal is the church. I mean, we just conforms talked to the world a month or two ago about the Church of England. You know, their um, pride adherence in their uh, in their government. You know, they're already talking about removing pastors um, or bishops or whatever from the Church of England if they don't get on board with the egalitarian worldview. You know, the old religions, right? They've got to be updated to the standards of the new religion. And Susie Owens here seems to be advocating for just that. You better update your old understanding there if you want to get with the modern times. Um, not on board with that. And um, it's one of the verses that she mentioned, um, <laughs> she said, I wish I would have pulled the clip. I didn't think about it. But she mentioned in the vein of females being called to preach, she says, you can't curse what God has blessed. She points that out. Uh, that's one of her scriptural references there for not speaking against female leadership in the church. And, uh, that is a reference to numbers chapter 22 and 23, what she's reaching back to there. And that's the story of, ba uh, Balak. Balak and Balaam. Yeah. And, uh, let me see. I have those verses, um, 20, uh, numbers 22 verse 12 says, let me get that pulled up, says, do not go with them. This is God speak. It says, God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Um, and then later on down in Numbers chapter 23, uh, verse 8, it says, or God says, how shall I curse, or Balaam says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? So this is what she's referencing about not speaking against uh, female pastors in the church. Now, we, of course, believe Numbers chapter 22 and 23. It's God's word, so it's true. Uh, we cannot curse what God has blessed. We would absolutely adhere to that. Is that talking about you or Israel? Right. And that, <laughs> I would say, is the question, right? Um, the question would be, did or has God blessed women to be leaders in the home and in the church? Because if he did, then sure, we can't curse it. But if not, then this doesn't apply. Because He has, if he hasn't blessed you into those roles, then you're just misusing um, this context. I mean, that would be like, claiming people that aren't Israel are God's blessed and chosen people and saying you can't curse them. You're like, oh, the Philistines, you know, don't curse what God has blessed. And you're like, God doesn't bless the Philistines. Mm -hmm. You know, who says I can't curse them? So again, we believe numbers 22 and 23. I don't think Susie knows what she's talking about. But again, we think she's a heretic. Um, not to say that offensively. We're going to show here in a minute why I think. Um, think she is. But I think another thing that we need to wrestle with here in America, in the American church, uh, and I think we need to wrestle and defeat it, is this idea that just because someone says they were called or someone was chosen or that God spoke to them, whatever happens to be, just because they say it, that it makes it so. 
we need to defeat that idea. Just because you say something does not, in fact, make it so, right? Susie saying she felt called by God to preach means nothing. <laughs> Again, if God's word doesn't support her assertion, then it doesn't matter what she says or felt or heard or anything like that, the mm -hmm. dream she had. None of that stuff matters if it doesn't actually adhere to God's word. Yeah, your desires of the flesh can be used in the wrong way. Um, you can have an evil desire and it's, you know, you can say it's godly. You can do something in the name of God, what she's advocating for, but going against scripture. It's, it's an evil, it's a, it's a desire of the flesh. You want to make a name for yourself. Like what's the motive? Why do you want to be a preacher? You're and, and the main thing she, you know, travels and preaches about is to help women see their higher calling than just being at home with your kids and teaching them the word of God. Like right. that's evil to teach women that there's something greater than ministering to your own children. Yeah. Um I just think that's an idea just largely we should um, try to dismiss and we should try to defeat, you know, when we hear it or somebody brings it up to us, uh, again, test everything against the word of God, just because you thought something hurt. And really, I think it's largely a defensive mechanism. You can't question me. God told me. You can't question me. God gave me a dream. Okay, well, I can't verify that, right? We're supposed to test all things, some, you know personal revelation that no one else knows about, but you claim, like, I can't verify any of that. I can't test it against the word of God to know if it's true. So I think we really need to sort of dismiss those sorts of claims. I'm not saying again, right? God can do what he wants. If he puts a special calling on someone's heart, but God's he not gives a, liar. a revelation. I'm not saying God can't do that, but using that as sort of the sole argument for why you're doing something Hey, I notice you've never given a single penny to God in offerings or uh, tithes. Or me and God got our own thing worked out. Oh, enough said. Bob said him and God got his own thing worked out. He can keep all of his money. No worries. I still have to tithe and give my offerings and all those sorts of things. Yeah, Bob's good though because there's a lot of that. People who are in doing something that's clearly against Scripture, but they say, "Well, I prayed about it." Why yeah. would you pray about something and you're waiting for an answer and your answer's in scripture, but you won't go to scripture? You know, me and my girlfriend, we're married in God's eyes already. But are you married? Well, no, but in God's eyes. Really? All right, then. <laughs> you're sinning. So, um, yeah, we should defeat that idea. So let's go back to Trina here. Let's hear what Trina has to say. And she's apparently a complementarian, although I'm not sure if she... She really is. Let's see what she has to say. Um, if you when when we look in Ephesians, and why am I telling you this? You, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You can see right that that men are the head of the house, and as women, we submit to that, and we see that in Ephesians five. But but we can't skip. Ephesians 5 21 when it talks about submitting to one another so in the, in the different I do want to say I noticed with her she's like afraid to offend uh Susie because before anytime she's about to say something that's a little um different or correcting her with scripture in the most gentle way she's always you know how she's like well, why am I telling you this like yeah, telling because she doesn't know it probably but she's afraid to you. offend or upset Susie. Like, I don't know if you picked up on that, but oh, yeah, she no. does that to Susie a lot. Like, she wants to soften everything and compliment her before she brings up the scripture. Yeah, I mean, she definitely was overly, like, apologetic for believing something different in scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm glad that she pointed out Ephesians here, uh, that there are different roles that God has ordained for us. But again, her almost like apologizing for reading that and having a clear understanding of what it says. Um, and this, again, ties back to, I think, what we talked about with Vodi and his red flags um, a few weeks ago. Because one of the red flags he mentioned is that 
you know, if you have a church leader who is apologizing for scripture, that's a red flag. And I see that here with her apologizing almost in a sense that yeah, I'm sorry that I read this in the word and this is what it means. If you're, and again, I think she claims to be a preacher, this Trina girl, you should not be apologizing for what you clearly read in scripture. Um, if that's God's word, it's not your you know, responsibility to apologize for it. Uh, we shouldn't be re- apologizing for what God has spoken to us. Mm-hmm. But uh, right. I think we have two more clips here to play. I think, unfortunately, one more of them is from, or actually both of them, I think, are from Susie. We got a lot from Susie There's just here. a lot to warn about. I think yeah, that's... Yeah, warning when it yeah. comes to Susie Owens. So let's hear this next clip from Susie. I feel that there is purpose in every person's life. I feel we are born with purpose and destiny, the design of God is enmeshed within that purpose. And so once we discover our purpose, then we can begin to walk in a closer content of what God wants us to do. And what so if you don't know your high calling, you're useless to God, is what she's saying. Yeah, you're not fulfilling your purpose here. But, <laughs> you know, this to me is like a different faith other than Christian. Yeah. You know, this idea of destiny and your calling and finding your purpose. You know, it's mm-hmm. like a, I don't know if there's an actual term for it. You know, if you guys know what we're talking about, help us out in the comments. But it's like a high calling teaching. You know, there's some great overarching, high calling, great plan and purpose that God wants each person to achieve in their life for his kingdom. And if you don't achieve the high calling, well, then you're not really serving God to your full potential. I think because people are getting caught up in putting themselves in the position of prominent characters in the Bible, yet the other ones don't get spotlighted, like Moses' mom. She did a great thing. But what did she do after that? After she put him in the basket? Did she just go back to her wifely duties and raising her older kids? Well, like, I think she nursed Moses. Well, she did too. Yes. But yeah, I get your point. Right. Like, <laughs> why didn't yeah. the father do that? Every time we oh, see. Oh, yeah. Them. That's only a woman's role. <laughs> yeah. They're unique. Yeah. I mean, we never look at ourselves and be like, I'm Uriah. No, we're always King David. We're always like the great hero. We're not like, you know, in the temple. I'm the guy, you know, out sweeping the floors, doing my duty for the Lord, keeping the temple clean, right? Whatever you do, do unto the Lord. You are serving him. It doesn't have to be. But I don't know if like the high calling thing, to me, it seems sort of linked, you know, and to kind of that prosperity gospel, the word of faith that you can, you know, you should be achieving greatness in a sense if, you know you're really walking according to God's purpose for your life. And, you know, I disagree with it. I think the reformers had it right. You know, they got it right, in my opinion, when they said the chief end of man is to, uh, what did they say? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's your high calling. That's your chief And what did Jesus say um, when he returns and he separates the sheep from the goats and he talks about the things that what they did or didn't do did you visit those in prison did you you know did you care for me when i was sick did you clothe me feed yeah. me all those aren't the things that these people are talking about in here these are the lowly servant things that nobody notices but god maybe a couple people in your life but that's the stuff that matters not this high calling garbage nonsense yeah, I mean, again, I, I go back to Stephen, right? Did he miss out on his high calling? Or was his high calling to go feed orphans? I mean, not even a high calling. Was it, He's serving the Lord, right? But that is Where what Jesus says. The, yeah. Those who humble themselves like a servant, but they will be the ones who are, um, what do you say, elevated, you know, honored. Because I don't think anybody that has this high calling theology is ever going to be satisfied um, outside of a prominent leadership role, right? Like if you believe in this high calling destiny that God has, where we're walking in this great purpose that he has, no one's ever going to see that as 
the secretary at the church, making sure the finances are on point. No one's ever going to see that. They're going to see it as Billy Graham preaching to millions. That's always the high calling. Well, you need the people in the lesser positions for life to function. That's like, why I think it's a you false You go to teaching. the grocery store. You're only able to buy that food because there's farmers. There's people stocking the shelves who they're serving you. They get paid less than you, but you're judging them that they're not living up to their potential. But they're blessing you. They're serving you. They're helping you. It's yeah. just so... I think it's just a false teaching, and I think it breeds discontent in the church. I think it breeds sort of discontent Mm -hmm, in your own faith walk, Mm -hmm. you know, that you should be doing more. And um, if you're not doing more, somehow God isn't going to be pleased with you. And I think it's wrong. You know, I think your purpose on life or purpose, purpose in life, purpose on this earth is to love God and to serve God. That is your purpose. And you serve God in practical ways by serving others in the in the church. Yeah, and you know, we've mentioned the old John MacArthur quote here, you know, you worry about the depth of your ministry and he'll take care of the breadth, right? You serve mm. God as good as you can, wherever you are, yeah. as joyfully, as passionately mm-hmm. as you can. And if he decides to bless you with more and bigger, that's God's will, you know, you're not going to Yeah, influence you can be him. a Joseph. I think that's where they would go with it, though. <laughs> yeah, you can be... Be jo- faithful with the little. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. I'm not a fan of that teaching. Um, Again, not to say that people don't have callings on their life. I'm not suggesting that. But the idea that everybody has some great destiny, high calling, uh, I think breeds discontent. Yeah. But uh, another thing that Susie and Trina brought up here during this discussion, they mentioned that uh, submission and headship is an individual issue for Christians. So again, Trina's supposed to be a complementarian, but she kind of I don't know, she explicitly mentions that it's an individual issue. And I think Susie mentions that there wasn't some kind of like blanket rule over the whole world. Again, this is an individual thing. If you want to submit at home to your husband, you know, and again here, we would disagree. Uh, Headship is a universal rule in God's kingdom, and all believers should be submitting to God's standards as laid out uh, in his word. You know, Ephesians chapter 5 they mention um, Ephesians chapter 5, so we'll just highlight it here as well. It says, well, do you want to read Ephesians 5, 22 through 24? Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Yeah, you know, in the next sentence, verse 25 is not, if that works for you, fine. If not, do what you want, right? That's not what Paul says after that. So these are universal commands for every believer to follow. This isn't an individual issue. It's not like, well, Nikki submits to me because it just works for her, but, you know, Karen down the road, she lords over Bill because that's the way their household operates. Not if they're Christian. This is a universal command. So I don't like this teaching that, um, you know, hey, if it works for you, fine. If not, just figure out your own system. But again, that's that's looking to yourself for the truth. Yeah. It's not looking to God. It's putting your opinion above God's word. Even in your mind, if you think it works better, you're still being disobedient. It's hard to follow the truth sometimes, but if you're both willing, yeah, it's going to be easier. Yeah. Um, And again, you should not be unequally yoked in your marriage, right? This is why you don't want to marry unbelievers or, um, you know, people that aren't with you where you are in your faith. It just causes problems. Um, But they go on in here to not just say that, you know, kind of this submission thing is an individual issue. They both... They both basically agree and point out um, that, and I I think really, I mean, both of them are pretty awful in my opinion, and I hope I'm not cursing God's blessed. Forgive me if I am here, Susie. But uh, they mentioned multiple times that if your church doesn't affirm you, so if you're a woman and you believe you're called to go preach and your church doesn't affirm you, you should leave the church and go find another that will affirm you. You know, 
Trina even makes the point, who's supposed to be a complementarian, you know what, there's another church just, just down the road, and they may accept you and this sort of thing. And What if your husband doesn't affirm you in that? Are you, you going to submit to him? Yeah, that'd be a good question to follow up with. And I just think this is an awful, awful opinion to offer up here and yeah, to tell people and instruct them that, you know what, if your church tells you what you want to do isn't right, leave. Go find another church that will tell you what you want to do is right. It's about you and not really about loving the people there at that church that you have so many opportunities to serve in the way Jesus actually taught us to serve. But no, your gift is is more important and glorifying to God than than loving and serving people. Yes, your specific gift is more valuable than the church, the body of Christ in the earth. But yeah, this makes church all about you. Right. You find a church that's going to do everything that you want to make you happy. And if you don't, well, get up and leave, right? This throws the entire idea of church discipline right out the window. Why would you accept church discipline? As soon as somebody pushes back on you at all, just bail. Go find a different church that will affirm, you know, all the ungodly things that you're doing. Um, like, reject this if somebody tells you this. Again, not to say that there's never a reason to move churches, or anything like that. But if the reason you're moving to church is because the leadership or the church members there told you that maybe you're living in sin or error or your beliefs are off base and you just bail to find someone that will, that is a terrible teaching. The chances that they're all wrong and you're right for you to believe that, that's that's pride. Yeah. You're basically saying that the, somehow the church, Christ's body in the world, is a hindrance to the high calling that God has placed in your life. This is a very flawed and a very self-seeking theology that we should all reject. So a lot of awful here from Susie. But this kind of moved towards the end. So the first hour of it was just open discussion kind of a thing. The last like 15 minutes, Nicole kind of said were rapid fire questions. And the first question that she asked here was to Susie. And she was asking them, what is your scriptural basis for your belief on egalitarian or complementarian. And um, Susie, in her initial rapid-fire response, basically comes right out and lays out her heresy. So let's hear what she has to say. I go right there, Galatians 3.28. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, born nor free. And then I piggyback back to Timothy, first and second epistles of Timothy, when Paul starts a conversation with I, Paul. So who am I going to believe, what Jesus said or what I, Paul, said? Who so that is heresy. Who was she quoting in the first scripture? She was quoting, I guess, she was quoting Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, so, uh, where Paul is teaching that there's neither male nor, which is, she's... I, they're both from Paul. She's asserting that, you know, that's Christ teaching to Paul that there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, but then she's saying when Paul's writing to Timothy in First and Second Timothy, that's just Paul. So basically the idea is Galatians 3.28 that tells her she can be a preacher, that's Christ's instruction. Whereas Paul it's writing the letter, about a position. It's just, right, but that is a heresy Yeah. to say that, well, Timothy was just Paul's thoughts. He was just writing down what he thought. So I don't have to believe Paul, but I should believe Christ. And that is a her heretical teaching because every word of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul did not make up what he was teaching to Timothy. Um, I'm glad she exposed herself. I mean, in one way, I'm glad she said that because a lot of people will catch that. And a lot of other people will probably believe her that they can make a, a distinction in some words are God's. They better catch her. Um, you need to catch that. But she definitely called herself out here like an obvious heretic by saying that. Right, because to say that, well, we should believe Christ's teachings because he's God, is to dismiss the fact that the rest of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and then it's to make the Holy Spirit lesser in deity than Christ. That right. if the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these words, yeah, but it doesn't carry the same weight as Jesus. Okay, well, now you're dismissing the Trinity, Mm -hmm. Um, and she's exposing herself as a, a heretic. So Paul's writings to Timothy are just as authoritative. They are, they carry the exact same weight as Christ's teachings because they come from the Holy Spirit. 
who is equal in, in authority to Christ. So do not believe this teaching. This is heresy. Um, and I'm glad she exposed herself, but do not, do not accept this that. This makes you wonder why they decided to have her on this. Like she didn't, she didn't even make a good argument for the egalitarian. Like she just sounds off, well, like on both sides. Like I think even the people on egalitarian see her as off. Yeah, and that's the problem where this conversation was nice because it was kind of a, just to give them a chance to explain. But this is the point where somebody on this panel should have been like, hold up. No, no, no. We are not dismissing Paul's teachings as just being thoughts of Paul yeah. and not being the word of God. Yeah. Nobody pushed back, right? They just, oh, thank you, Susie. Instead of being like, what did you say? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we got people with doctorates in ministry and theology. Nobody Nobody's thought to pipe Hopefully up and go. Hopefully afterward they corrected her just for the sake. I don't know. It's like, come out with another article right after this defending the Trinity and God's word. Like, Right. They should have put out a disclaimer on here that like, hey, we just want you to know these are not the views held by Christianity today. Uh, we believe in, you know, the inspiration of the entirety of scripture, all these sorts of things. But um, heresy from Susie Owens here. So... Moving along here, they asked Trina, what did you, you know, what's your basis for being a complementarian? She literally had no scripture. She just said somehow the New Testament paints a picture, apparently. And I don't know if she was saying it paints egalitarianism. That's what it sounded like, even though she's supposed to be complementarian. I don't think she knew what she believed. So you shouldn't trust what she believes. That's my point Maybe of view. Maybe she was having her mind changed during the discussion. <laughs> yeah. If somebody that's trying to teach you doesn't really seem sound or solid in what they're teaching you, I would look for other teachers. Yeah, you come away not even knowing where they stand. So in that vein, definitely go and check out our recommended listing when we get to it, because that's a teacher who is sure of their teaching. Uh, so then going back to Kara Carvalho, she mentions again that Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, that was her foundation and the scriptural basis for her, what I believe is egalitarian beliefs, you know, that God created... Um, his created order. He created us equal in every way. Again, she mentions the differences. Would love to hear what she thinks those gifting and functions are between the different genders, mm -hmm. uh, different sexes, but she doesn't highlight that. Things need to be defined. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, Lily, again, we didn't play anything from her. She didn't have a specific verse either. You know, she says she's complementarian, but her basically response was, what's your scriptural basis? And she said, equality. <laughs> in a sense, you're like, all right, sure. That doesn't um, mean anything. Doesn't make any sense. And then Lauren McAfee, she touched on Genesis in the created order, but she touched on it in what I would consider as the proper way, mm -hmm. that man was created first, woman was created as the helper. And then she went to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the qualifications for a pastor. Mm -hmm. And it, it struck me as funny when I'm watching this. I was like, we've gone through this whole discussion, literally like an hour and 10 minutes into it before anybody brought up 1 Timothy chapter 2, the most clearest explanation of I the know. qualifications, not a single person. Maybe she saved it to the end because they didn't want it to be a debate. They wouldn't, you know, I think, I think Susie would have had a hard time keeping her mouth closed or something. She, it might've turned into a debate and that's not what they wanted. So yeah. saving it till the end was, was really smart. Yeah, and then Nicole Martin, uh, she mentioned that her scriptural basis was Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. That was her scriptural basis, and I'm kind of paraphrasing off what I remember, but that was, I think, generally the instruction from Paul to Phoebe to take the letter of, um, mm. to the Romans and share the letter with the Romans. So that was her basis of like, hey, Paul chose Phoebe. Reading now a letter is not being a pastor. Pastors, right. So that was the, the scriptural basis she went to, so... That's administrative. That was her belief. Um, but I guess in light of Susie Owens, they all look like rock solid theologians. But uh, do you have any final thoughts here as we get ready to move on from this debate and keep the show rolling? Teach your children what the Bible says. If we want things to go the right way, in several years, we need to teach our children. Um, 
like I talk with our older daughter a lot. I, you know, she actually watched some of this with me and she actually caught on. I said, listen to this part right here that this lady Susie says, um, where she was saying, oh, that's Paul. That's not Jesus. Oh, I don't have to. She caught on to that. I said, you listen to it. I'm not going to tell you what's wrong with it. You catch it. And she's like, but it's all, the Bible's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm so proud of her. <laughs> yeah. um, teach them that scripture is the authority on all matters. Um, because there's a lot of false teachers out there, obviously. Um, spend time with your kids. Be joyful in raising your kids. Don't um, come off to them that raising them is stressful. Um, if they see mom and dad stressed and upset with them all the time, just correcting them all the time and not having good moments uh, with them, be intentional, do do things with them that are good and show that you enjoy raising them, um, that will help. <laughs> You yeah. have to show them that it's a joy to serve. And if you have young kids, this would be a great debate for them to sit and listen to and have a discussion about. If you have Bible study times with your kids, listen to this stuff and go, what do you think about that? You know, let's look up these verses and see what Genesis 1 through 3 is talking about. What is, you know, those are good discussion topics to have with your kids. Yeah, so do both. Teach <clears throat> them, but demonstrate that it is a joy to serve them, to to raise children, to do those servant things that nobody sees, to to change the diapers. If you have older kids and they're watching you care for a baby, and that's that's hard work. You're not getting any sleep. You're probably, you hardly even get to shower. You're so busy all the time. Be joyful in that as the older children are watching and they're going to think it's a burden to have kids or it's a blessing. We need to be very aware of how we come off um, in our serving the Lord through these types of things that the world and the church is starting to look down on. So that's it. <laughs> yeah. And I would just say, you know, this is the third webinar that we've discussed on here that we've listened to. I haven't really changed my opinions after listening to these. Yeah. Uh, I think these arguments for egalitarianism, you know, I still think it's born far more out of feminism, out of modernity, if you will, than an honest searching of God's word. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not saying that there aren't good arguments out there, uh, but these women, they have not presented them, in my opinion. You know, but to the contrary, I think the people like Susie Owens, they've highlighted themselves as heretics in the process, and that certainly does not lend credibility to their argument. Mm -hmm. So why is this important to Christians? I think it's important because this discussion and this debate isn't going away anytime soon. Um, and we should probably more expect it to increase than decrease, you know, as mm -hmm. DIE in this nation continues to gain steam. Uh, I think the debate's only going to increase. So I think you need to find your theological footing on this issue. You know, you should find it now so that you're not steamrolled by sort of this progressive mm -hmm. Christian movement later on. Um, but also, you know, all issues like Nish Nikki mentioned that pertain, um, or the scriptures pertain to all issues in our life, you know, but everything regarding life and godliness, um, those are all important matters. You know, there's nothing that scripture teaches on that isn't important. Now, some may be more important than others, you know, those sort of essential doctrines, but all issues that scripture teaches on is important for us. And we as Christians should take on the challenge to study and show ourselves approved in all areas to the best of our ability. Yeah. Even in this debate between the complementarians and egalitarians. You know, so what should we do about it? I think my recommendation is to, um, I guess I, I'm a little bipolar on this one. I think in one respect, you should avoid sort of listening to these discussions from Christianity today. But then in another sense, I think maybe you should expose yourself and your kids to it and see what arguments are out there. Um, they need to know the enemy because if they don't know the enemy's sneakiness, they could fall for it. Yeah. You know, because those arguments are out there. So I guess in, in a sense, exposing yourself to that is good. But then, um, you know, I would just advise you as someone, if you're reading and studying the Bible, generally sort of a straightforward, simple understanding of the word is the right understanding. Yes. You know, when mm -hmm. you talk about 
uh, these women talking about ah, Genesis one through three or Rick Warren, the great commission and sort of these muddled understandings where they're pulling out theological ideas. Most times the simple, straightforward understanding of that is the right one, right? You read the qualification for elder pastor. That's just the qualification. It's that simple. You don't have to, you know, outthink the room or try to parse words. That would be my advice. Mm -hmm. And then what should we do about, or how should we pray about it? I'm sorry. Um, I think it would be good for all of us to be praying that we are not led by our feelings mm -hmm. because it's easy to see when someone else is, it's a lot harder to see when we are, you know, so we want to pray that we're not being led by our feelings or even our traditions, our experiences, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that we would be people that test everything against scripture. Um, and then that we would have the courage to sort of go where God's word leads us. You know, if that means laying down traditions and experiences and, feelings, then we need to have the courage and the faith to do that. Mm -hmm. Pick up what we need to pick up, lay down what we need to lay down. So that is, uh, it was a good discussion, interesting discussion. Links will be in the show notes if you want to go give that a listen for yourself. But be warned, it is full on today's Christianity. Mm -hmm. It is uh, a lot to take in. But all right, we do want to end with a few stories from around the country and around the world, I guess, in a sense, that really caught our attention. We're not going to have a Bible topic today. This show is already running very long. Um, but these were interesting stories we wanted to discuss. Um, and then we'll get to our recommended listening. So uh, the first two stories here, uh, they are basically linked, um, and they aren't light. They're not uh, overly light and jovial stories because uh, they're on suicide. And before we get into these um, articles and stories, I just want to mention that I understand some people may have uh, suffered with suicide in their own family, loved ones, that sort of thing, you know, whatever the case may be. And we're certainly not trying to like hurt feelings or disparage anyone, but I think Christians have to be people that speak about hard and uncomfortable truths. And they have to be people that speak about them openly and honestly as best as possible. So that's what we're going to try to do here in the, the vein of suicide. So I just wanted to kind of make that statement here. And then reading these two ar uh, articles, I'm going to have a statement on the first and a question on the second article. So do you want to read this first article headline? Canadian Hospital Offers Assisted Suicide to Woman Seeking Help for Suicidal Thoughts. And then just that first paragraph... A woman who sought psychiatric help at a hospital in Canada said staff made her feel worthless by suggesting she end her life through the national health care system's medical assistance in dying uh, program, which they call MAID, um, as the country seeks to expand eligibility to people suffering from mental illness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your diagnosis or solution for suicidal thoughts? Suicide. Thanks, Doc. Like, think how perverse and evil your mind has to be to believe that this is the best treatment for mentally ill people. Like, you don't want to live your life always thinking about dying. So die. So just kill yourself and you won't think about it anymore. Oh, my gosh. Like, I can't tell you another industry in my mind that has lost more credibility over the last few years than the medical industry. Yeah. I mean, boy, have they just flushed decades of credibility down the drain. There is a lot of godlessness, a lot of evil in the medical industry. And you can see, right, they're getting ready to, it says here, they're expanding eligibility for medical assisted suicide to mentally ill people. And you can expect that not too far behind this is handicapped people and probably then the poor, right? All you dregs on society will just kill you and life will be better for the rest of I us. Mean, seriously, just in light of the what we just talked about, like with these women teaching you have a high calling and your 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 disappointment to God if you're just a homemaker. Pretty much that's the message. Like it's seeping into the church. Right. And think about the juxtaposition between the secular religion of pride that has taken over Western culture 
and the true faith of Christianity, right? True faith is caring for widows and orphans. Mm -hmm. The secular faith is kill those wid widows and orphans. They're a drag. Um, there's your <sighs> secular morality for you. But do you want to read this next paragraph here? Or there's a, I think I cut a couple of these uh, sentences together. Okay. Uh, Catherine Mentler, 37, went to the Vancouver General Hospital's access and assessment center in June, hoping to check herself in to protect herself from acting on her suicidal thoughts. According to the Christian Institute, a uh, clinician then asked Mentler if she had considered MADE, that acronym for assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she came in and said, I'm suffering with suicidal thoughts. And they were like, have you considered suicide? So two things pop out. Either this person's an idiot, this clinician, and they shouldn't be trusted with caring for other people, or they're perverse and evil. Um, I would venture to guess maybe both. But um, this is the mind of a person without God. And Canada sort of collectively seems to be drifting quicker and quicker into a nation that's turned its back on God. You know, this is the, the mindset, like life is meaningless and only material happiness matters. Only that's of any value. Like this is nihilism, which atheists almost have to be nihilist, I think, if they're true to themselves. Like if you aren't happy, die, because who cares? That's the mindset. Boy, doesn't that sound uplifting? Yeah, let's get rid of that Christian faith, that old-timey Christian faith for the new science-backed secular view of morality. If you're not happy, die. Great. Um, the article goes on down here to say at the end, according to an annual report on MADE uh, in Canada for the year 2021, there are 10,064 MADE provisions reported in the country, which accounted for 3.3 of all deaths in Canada. Since the Parliament of Canada legalized assisted suicide in 2016, there have been 31,664 deaths from MAID. Oh my gosh. Like that many people who just have suicidal thoughts? That's a lot. And that's just the ones they convinced. Yeah, like the same people. This is the debased mind that Paul would talk about. These same people that are so up in arms that we need to get rid of guns. They're killing everybody. Their solution to problems is kill you. But we got to get rid of it. You know, it's going to kill people. These guns. I bet you more people in Canada have died from assisted suicide than probably gunfire. Oh, yeah. Uh, in that country. Um, but the statement I wanted to make. So I said I wanted to make a statement and ask a question. This is the statement. Uh, there is no dignity and there is no humanity in assisted suicide. There is only weakness and there's only wickedness. You know, these medical professionals, they're not heroes. They are villains. They're taking the lives of the most vulnerable rather than actually providing the care that they should be providing. That's what these people are going to them for. And instead, they're killing them. They're villains. There is no dignity in suicide. And this kind of brings me to a point that I've wanted to make for some time, and I'm glad this provided me the opportunity. Uh, we live in, you know, the technological West, right? So advanced and you know, we love to fancy ourselves as having the answers to everything. Um, you know, we live in a time where we think there's nothing that science and the modern man can't solve. And that is just flat out a lie. <laughs> I think what we know is very little, but what we propagandize and what we indoctrinate to is very great. So we give off the impression that we can solve everything. We have all the answers when in fact, we don't. We just simply market ourselves very well as having all these answers and all these solutions, but it's little more than marketing, right? Here we have the most, you know, educated, most learned medical professionals in the world. And what they're telling you is we don't have the answers to what ails you. We can't solve your problems. Um, and since they most likely don't know God, they can't actually offer the real solution mm -hmm. to any of these problems, right? So it's instead, a spiritual problem. In many and respects, nobody's it's a spiritual problem. Going to admit that they want nothing to do with God, it is. Well, and I would, yeah, I mean, I don't have the numbers, but I would venture to guess most of this increase in mental illness coincides very nicely with our decrease in spiritual faith. Well, I can't say all depression is a spiritual issue. 
because I'm always brought back to Charles Spurgeon who suffered depression, which I read in that Susie Spurgeon book. He dealt with depression. He wasn't suicidal. So I know there's varying degrees of depression. And his could have just been like a seasonal depression because he did travel to warmer climates in the winter. Um, but he was not suicidal. So I think the suicide aspect of it might be a spiritual thing. It's well, I mean, hormonal. Yeah. Depression without no. God, there's no relief. Right. There's no way out. I've dealt know. with bouts of depression. There's momentary but, relief, but there's nothing lasting. But it is a chemical thing because it is when I would eat poorly, high carbs, sugar, I'd have a depression over me, but not like a suicidal, nothing like this, but like a... Well, I think there's also the, you know, I think Proverbs, I can't think of the verse. Shame on me, Scott, if you're listening, because he knows this, but <laughs> Proverbs says anxiety in the heart causes depression. Mm. You know, I would venture to guess most yes. godless people with no hope for eternity are quite anxious about yeah. things. Um, you have no hope to rest in. But yeah, so I think, you know, these people who present themselves as having the answers to everything, they can't solve most of these issues, right? So their solution is just kill yourself. Um, and they're just shameful degenerates. It's like instead whole lot of, of it is like a pride thing with that too, that they don't want to admit that they can't help. So they twist the assisted suicide into so for people to view that as help, as a solution. Yeah, it is not a solution. Again, there is no dignity in suicide. Yeah. Just in general. So there they're no boasting dignity. in helping. No, in I'm that sure respect. they are. They're just like they you boast off into in all eternity. You know, the gender reassignment, they boast in helping women through giving them abortions. It's right. they all abor- they uh boast in murdering children. Yeah. But there's no uh, dignity. You know, it made me think of the kamikaze pilots, you know, in World War II from Japan. The jihadists, you know, that are blowing themselves up with suicide vests. There is no dignity in those either, right? There's no dignity in suicide. And I say all this, and the reason I wanted to bring it up is because, as we've mentioned before, the same people um, in the same medical establishment that's governing in Canada is the same establishment governing here in America, just without the constitutional restrictions. It's really the only thing holding them back. So, I wonder if any of the candidates we can are they going to be asked about assisted suicide, like these things, these topics. Is this going to be something that's brought up, their Maybe view of it? Tucker Carlson might ask him, no one else. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you don't think that these sorts of discussions and topics could come to our shores or that they could never come to our shores, uh, boy, I think you're kidding yourself. And I think it's things that you need to be talking about, sharing about, praying about, um, because suicide is on the rise. Hopelessness is on the rise as our faith in God wanes in this nation. So these problems aren't going away. Because the only solution is the one we seem to be running fast and far from, and that's mm-hmm. God. So I think we as Christians, especially, we need to be people that foster an environment of life. And this goes for the pro-choice, you know, sort of argument. Again, you can't advocate strongly for, you know, uh, for life and an environment of life, and then also say at the same time it's good to go kill your kid or it's acceptable, right? We need to foster life at every level. Every life is precious, and you know. God creates it, and it's God who determines our days. And um, mm-hmm. we should view every day that we live and breathe as a blessing from God and see it as an opportunity to serve him faithfully. Whether your life is prosperous and you're fulfilling your high calling or it's filled with pain and sorrow, um, mm-hmm. those are still opportunities to serve God and serve him faithfully. And it's sinful for us to try to... Um, you know, pull our own ejection handle, if you will, and get out of here uh, ahead of God's determination. So do you have any thoughts on assisted suicide before we move on to our second story regarding suicide? Um, I didn't think of it before when we were writing our notes, but um, assisted suicide, would you view that as someone committing suicide or were they tricked? Um, Because I know we're going to talk more on on suicide, you know, if it's affects your eternal state or not. But if you're coerced or convinced that it's good, um, that it's for the betterment, I don't know if I would view it as 
Suicide, I would view it as murder if they convince the person to go through with it. I think that is like a mental abuse on someone who already has a mental illness and they were seeking help. So, yeah, I think it's murder on the doctor's hands and it's suicide on the patient's hand. But if they were convinced, like they were just like they really didn't want to die, but it's like that they're already. I mean, maybe it, I guess it would depend on the <clears throat> level of mental handicap. Yeah. You know, so some people are probably mentally yeah. handicapped enough to where you could like, abuse a, them in that way. What about and, even a child who's dealing with like a really horrible, whatever their ailment is or their handicap or something, like a little kid to convince a little kid. And maybe they don't even quite grasp what it means. Yeah, I mean, to, to some to degree, die. sure. Yeah, you could say now, yeah, I mean, maybe children or, you know, severely mentally handicapped type people. Yeah, maybe they, don't they aren't know really what sure doing. of what they're signing off on or what they're agreeing to and that sort of thing. But by and large, and from the stuff that we're reading here, and in that story, it highlights a an adult man who was just like, yeah, I'm kind of fed up with struggling. So I said I wanted to kill myself all right well murder on the doctor's hands suicide on his hands in my opinion right it can be both but in some cases it can be just murder and they were just taking advantage of the the weak yeah i'm sure in some cases yeah okay well we can move on i know we're gonna talk more on that but all right so do you want to read the headline of this second article pastor dies by suicide after girlfriend rejects marriage proposal. And then just read these first two paragraphs. A young pastor in Nigeria's Anambra state, sorry, I'm probably going to butcher some of these names too, um, jumped from a two-story building and died. Reportedly after his girlfriend rejected his marriage proposal, he was pronounced dead at the scene, according to reports. Identified as Pastor Prosper Obum Ibok, the 30-year-old man led a Pentecostal church in the Nui area of Anambra State, Nigerian Tribune reported Saturday, citing a relative who said the pastor took the fatal leap last month after his girlfriend, whom he had financially supported through university, declined his proposal for marriage. Yep. So uh, my question here for all of you guys listening, and I would love to get some responses on this, is can a Christian commit suicide? Um, You know, I think... So please let me know in the comments, send us an email. I'd love to hear your thoughts on yeah, this. Yeah, I think and there might be some perspectives that we haven't considered. This is, I think there's a lot of exceptions you could bring up, um, yeah, different it, reasons someone would commit suicide. It made me think, because I've thought about this before, and I think you mentioned something a week or so ago about it. And I think I told you, I was like, yeah, I don't think a Christian commits suicide um, or stated a different way. I don't think that someone who commits suicide will go to heaven or could be a Christian. And you're like, really? And I don't know if you'd like thought about it that much before. And so I was like, well, that's an interesting topic. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe I'm not thinking about it properly. So, But I've never had a discussion with anybody about it. Yeah, that's why I think, I think it's a fascinating discussion. people just don't discussion. talk about it. And again, with suicide on the rise, we see these wicked governments around the world that are advocating for people to kill themselves. I think it's a good time for us to have a discussion of mm-hmm. suicide is something Christians can do, or if you could go to heaven after committing suicide. and Yeah, if there are Christians who go into these clinics and they're worried that they won't go to heaven, they're going to be told, yes, you will. Like, they have to talk about the spiritual um, aspect to it because yeah, you'll have chances your, uh, are there are religious people who you'll have your are worried state about issued, that. You know, blue hair, non-binary reverend in the church there assuring you that heaven is secure for you. And, you know, my thought on the whole issue was, I do not believe that someone who has the Holy Spirit living in them, you know, having their hearts been brought to life by the Holy Spirit, I don't think that person could kill themselves. So I think the very act of killing yourself would indicate that the person was in fact never saved. You know, so for this pastor... You know, if you ask me, I would say that the man was never truly regenerate, regardless of what job he held, what he did or what he said, any of that sort of thing. Because I don't think that a true born again Christian can or would kill themselves. Hmm. So I'm curious what you guys would think on that. And I would love to know what you guys think about this topic. I do want to know what other people uh, have to say. Because I don't know hmm. that I've thought about it from every angle. 
Right. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. I do feel confident, you know, in my thoughts. But I, again, I'm open to being uh, corrected if there's more or different angles to think about. Yeah. And I think, I mean, right now, not that I won't change my mind if somebody brings up something. I think it's better to say they are not saved than that they were. Um, Because if you make light of suicide um, within eternal understanding uh, or mindset about it, um, you can lead people to believe that murder is not a sin if it's done to yourself. So we know that drunkenness is a sin and people get drunk to wash away their sorrow. So why would murder of your own self not be a sin for the same reason a drunkard drinks, if that makes sense. So they have sorrow and want to make it go away. And one of the ways someone handles that is drunkenness and another one handles it through murdering their own self. So you're not enduring in the faith until the end. Um, You are murdering. You are deliberately sinning even though you are in a sorrowful state, but that's still no excuse for deliberately sinning. Um, you don't you don't tolerate the sin of drunkenness in someone just because of the reason they drink, that they are depressed. And I know it sounds really harsh, and I'm not saying that I know 100% if those who commit suicide go to hell, but just trying to glean from Scripture— um, I'm just trying to think on sin and enduring till the end and the faith and, you know, those who live righteously and then turn away and deliberately deliberately sin at the end of their life, they don't go to heaven. So this is my my thinking with it all. So I would rather be harsh than soft on this than have someone's blood on my hands if I told them that it's okay to commit suicide and God will still let them into heaven. So I think it's right to believe what I'm saying than not, as I don't want to lead anyone to hell, convincing them it's not going to affect their eternal state. Um, So if I know someone who's suicidal and they're really contemplating ending, you know, if they're in like a bad physical state and really, and you kind of agree with them, like, yeah, maybe it'd be better if they died, but it's still murder. Like that would be on you telling them, like, would you really want to tell somebody, and you know 100% in your mind, like you're, you're going to say, you'll go to heaven, but you're telling them to murder themselves, like thinking about it that way. And I know this sounds harsh in looking at those who have committed suicide that you know in your life or that you've heard of. This sounds horrible, but in looking to the future, those who you can stop from doing that if it's true that they go to hell, like you have to have this view to save other people and keep your own hands clean. I would never want to tell somebody, I know 100% you're going to go to heaven if, if you go through with this. I would rather err on the side of caution and say, yeah, you probably would go to hell. So from that perspective, I know it's harsh in one sense, those who've passed away through suicide, but in order to save those who are alive now, who have suicidal thoughts, so does that, do you agree with that? I can, I used to no, not I, have that opinion, but really thinking about it that way, I. Well, right. I would say, yeah, if you have questions about, uh, would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? I would definitely err on the side of, if somebody asked me, I'd be like, yeah, no, you're not going to. Um, don't think. Yeah, you're taking your own life. Don't roll the dice on getting into heaven by killing yourself. Like but. if God, you have to also look at the sovereignty of God. Like God is. He's never commanded us to kill ourselves if things are uncomfortable in any way. Like, look what Job went through. He had every reason to want to end his life. I mean, his wife even said, curse God and die. And he remained faithful to God. Yeah. um, So, yeah, again, would love to hear you guys' thoughts. I think me and Nikki are in agreement here that um, we don't think Christians can commit suicide. And we don't think that those who commit suicide will go to heaven. But I think we're also in agreement that we're open to hear differing takes on yeah. the matter. If there is some scripture so, we're not aware of, yeah, we're not speaking in an authority on it. Yes, Third Corinthians um. tells us that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just an interesting, you know, discussion that me and Nikki had, and um, reading these articles brought up again. So we just we'd love to hear uh, because these are obviously important matters. And again, looking at our neighbors to the north, 
these may be matters that become more important as the uh, weeks and years continue on. So, uh, boy, congratulations. This is probably our longest episode ever. But we have one more final story that we want to talk about. And I want to mention it. I've wanted to mention it for a couple of weeks because it super creeped me out. Um, so everyone knows about the Maui wildfire, right? We talked about it with one of our prayer requests, I think a few weeks ago. So the wildfire started on August 8th, and it continued until around August 13-ish, you know, when it was kind of put out. So somehow, during that time, Nikki and I were, or Nikki was combing through comments or an article about this thing, and somebody pointed out a book that was listed on Amazon, and it was this book right here, Fire and Fury, the story of the 2023 Maui fire and its implications for climate change. Well, and it's interesting, this book is no longer listed on Amazon. I went and tried to follow the link to it, and it's been pulled down, which maybe bolsters our case of how creepy it is. Does it, but, it says on there now it was published in August 16th when before it said... No, that's the news article that I'm reading. Oh, the, the, okay. All right. This so, is the news article, not the Amazon. Yeah. It so that's what's creepy up. about it because this book was published on August 10th of 2023. So yeah. if you remember, the fire started August 8th, ended August 13th. Somehow this book was published on August 10th. And it's supposedly telling the story of the Maui uh, wildfire being published in the midst of the wildfire. And it mm -hmm. supposedly contained, you know, witness testimony. It's written by this Dr. Miles Stone, apparently. So there was a lot of comments uh, written that this book, it was actually written by AI, you know, mm -hmm. chat GPT or something similar. Mm -hmm. And I went and found this Snopes article. And Snopes basically determined that yes, in fact, this book is they well, they couldn't determine that this book was written by AI, because of um, digital copyright. But there have been other books by this supposed Dr. Milestone. And they ran some of his transcripts, and it's 100% AI written. So this book, and we bought it. So when it was still up on Amazon, we bought it for like eight bucks just to read through it. And Nikki was like, yeah, you could definitely tell like this is not worded properly, like yeah. the way that a normal person would write. And that was one of the things Snopes highlighted in a couple different um, sections that they pulled. They were like, just reading through this, you can tell that it's not written by like an actual person. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of what Nikki saw reading through the book. And um, it's kind of like reading some like report, like it's just a bunch of like facts, like too descriptive descriptive and when they ever whenever there's like a new paragraph it's you know you're the transition word like lastly or yeah they therefore. point out in like one there's of these, way uh, too many transition words to the next well one of the things that highlighted for snopes they said the amazon summary they point out in here like seven different times in this little summary it says the book chronicles the book describes the book also examines the book draws the book offers not the author yeah so they're like yeah these are things that highlight it but so it piqued my interest i thought it was creepy we bought the book and it made me think and this is why i wanted to talk about it you know we already have a news media that just sort of receives talking points and regurgitates them you know people put all those clips together, you know, whenever there's a mm -hmm. tragedy or whatever. And it's like every different news station under the sun says the exact same talking point. And we already have politicians that vote on bills without reading them. You know, the politicians no longer propose legislation. They just have think tanks or political, you know, PACs or corporations, whatever happens to be draft up their legislation. And then the politician goes and sponsors it. Like we live in a world that is ripe for AI, yeah. you know, proliferated fake news. And I thought, boy, you know, how long before we have AI that's just proposing legislation to Congress for them to pass? Oh my and gosh. It all gave me one uh, big thought. And it was like, you better get yourself a paper physical Bible. And I would suggest one that's quality and one that will last. And I'm going to put links down in the show notes to five or 10 quality Bibles for you to go and check out if you're interested. Um, there'll be affiliate links. So if you buy one, we'll get a small commission, but uh, at no extra cost to you, but good quality Bibles that will last you for years or decades. 
Um, because we've also talked in the past about, you know, Yuval Harari, the guy who talked about they're going to have AI generated Bibles coming up soon. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like we're going into a time when, you know, even Bible apps or like e-Bibles and these sorts of things could be compromised. And, you know, I went and read, you know, I've read 1984 years ago, but I went and found some quotes by them. And, you know, one of the quotes from 1984, it says, who controls the past, uh, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. And, you know, if I'm remembering 1984 correctly, I think that there were jobs in there where people would just go back and look through old newspaper headlines and stuff and change um, facts from old news stories to update it with the modern thoughts, you know, basically rewriting history. And I was like, man, you know, we're kind of already in, but we're definitely walking into a world where fake news is the only news and it could all yeah. be written by machines. You know, when I thought about this book, like mm -hmm. it could have been very easily for a news station, somebody, a talking head to grab this book and reference it as some sort of authority. Dr. Miles Stone mm -hmm. with eyewitness reports, completely all fabricated out of AI, you know. So I feel like it would be entirely possible and maybe even easy at some levels to just rewrite history in our technological world today. And, you know, history mm -hmm. is one thing, but the word of God is the only truth that we can count on, mm -hmm. you know? So if you've been relying on your phone, a tablet, an e-Bible, something to that effect for your Bible reading, I would just encourage you, please go and pick up a nice paper, physical Bible or two to have, you know, yeah. something that maybe, you know, these uh, 1984 histor or history rewriters couldn't go in and change, um, you know, you had that been here for a while, you know, AI creeps me out. <laughs> this book creeped me out, it creeped both of us out, which is why we bought it. Um, and I just believe that, you know, a physical Bible might become like the most important thing that we can own in our society. It already is. It's the word of God, but even more important to have a physical paper copy of the Bible. Um, because scripture at the end of the day is going to be the only thing that grounds us in truth. And uh, you, I don't know, if you want to run the risk of letting Yuval Harari have access to your app and trust that you can trust the words that are uh, in that Bible still, uh, I don't know if I'm that uh, trustworthy or trusting, I suppose. So uh, just a creepy story there. Do you have any final thoughts on uh, AI, this creepy book, buying real Bibles before we uh, roll into our recommended listening? I mean, after everything we talked about, everything... This comes down to the word of God. You need to know it. You really do. All these things we talk about, you can fight against it with the truth. Um, it's the answer to all of our problems. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. So, all right. We will end here with our recommended listening. And as we mentioned before, you know, um, trying to find somebody that had a good grasp on, you know, an, or a good understanding on, you know, they talked about Genesis one through three a couple times in our gender roles debate. So I thought, let's go find somebody who has a good grasp on scripture and see what he has to say about Genesis and the gender roles. So we got a link down in the show notes to a sermon by R.C. Sproul um, going for, on themes from Genesis um, on the idea of created male and female. So you can go give that a listen. It's always fun to watch young R.C. Sproul on his chalkboard, you know, uh, dissecting scripture. It's a good time. So go give that a listen. Come by, let us know in the comments, send us an email. That's all down in the show notes. We want to hear from you guys. And uh, that's all we really have. We'll be back next week um, with whatever the world throws at us. I, It will not be over two hours long. You have my word. If we go over two hours long, we definitely always have time for knowing sin. Don't you feel bad now? <laughs> you probably needed it after that conversation by Christianity Today. So we will be back next Saturday. We hope you guys have a blessed week.